Digital Enthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Lauren Gorn. And I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And today, we're getting enthusiastic about oral storytelling. But first, we have a fun new thing that you can do, which is that we've created a highly scientific <clears throat> personality quiz where you can answer some very fun and fanciful questions and find out which Lingthusiasm episode most closely corresponds with those responses. If you're new to the podcast and you're trying to figure out what episode to start with, or if you've been with us for ages and you want to dive into the back catalogue, or if you're trying to figure out which episode to recommend to a friend, our incredibly unscientific, <laughs> often amusing questioned quiz is there for you to find the perfect episode. You mean you don't think that like which beverage someone likes corresponds to which Lingthusiasm episode they're going to like? I think this is very scientific. Absolutely unvalidated, absolutely untested. They are entirely for your amusement at bit.ly slash Lingthusiasm quiz. Unscientific, but very fun. You can also find the link in the episode show notes. In our most recent bonus episode, we take this quiz ourselves to find out which episode we are, although of course, we love all of them as our children. And we also talk about the results of our 2023 listener survey. This one is rigorously scientifically constructed and tested. And we have all the results, including whether Lingthusiasm is more kiki or booba. And we discuss the results of important questions like, is the thumb a finger? And is your sister's husband's sister still your sister-in-law? You can go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm to get access to this bonus episode and way more behind the scenes and other fun topic bonus episodes that help us keep the show running for all of you. A conversation I enjoy having is to ask two people how they met, because sometimes you'll get this wonderfully honed and polished version of the story that they've both told that may not actually be entirely the original story, but is the story of how they met. And sometimes you get two completely different takes on the event, and that has its own value as well. And when it comes to the story of how we started this podcast, my version of the story is Lauren and I had been friends on the internet for a long time. We were finally hanging out in person at the first time at a conference. And Lauren was like, I've been thinking about starting a podcast. And I was like, I've been thinking about starting a podcast. And the rest, as they say, is history. Whereas I swear by the story that Gretchen was like, I would love to do a podcast. And I was like, I have skills that I could bring to your great idea for a podcast. We should do this together. And we had this conversation face to face, not over email uh, or over DMs or in somewhere where it might have been recorded. So we mm -hmm. have no record to know whose version of this memory is sort of factually what happened. But emotionally, both of us think that it was the other person's idea first, which I think is really funny. I've even gone back to look at early written interactions that we've had to see who started the conversation from social media through to like DMs and emails. And I'll tell you what, direct messages on social media platforms are not an archivist's friend. Yeah, it's really hard to actually find out what's going on. And even our first emails to each other, which we can find, are like continuing the conversation from DMs. Yeah. But this tendency to want to have our life histories documented is a very written culture technology sort of thing. And it's what made me recommend to you to read this short story by Ted Chang, mm -hmm. who I knew that you'd heard of as the author of Story of Your Life, which is the short story that was adapted into the movie Arrival. And he has this other short story called The Truth of Fact, The Truth of Feeling, which I thought you would enjoy. Do you want to give us a little summary of it? Sure. I mean, we've already talked about the fact that writing is a technology. We have a whole episode on the idea of putting symbols onto clay or paper or tortoiseshells is a very particular cultural invention. But what I like about this short story is it gets to the point that this technology brings with it all of these social changes and social dynamics uh, that create literacy. 
And so it's a short story, but uh, you get two for the price of one. There are like two completely different narratives uh, that are happening in this story. And the one that's specifically about writing is about Jijinki, who is a Tiv speaker from Tiv land. And a missionary named Mosby arrives in his village. And Jijinki is the only person in the village who takes Mosby up on the offer to learn how to write. And Mosby comes along with a whole colonial project, very much like British colonial vibes, uh, where writing comes along as a technology that is used to govern people administratively. So along with writing comes record keeping and trying to write down and codify histories and rules, and that brings with it all these changes to the social fabric of Tivland. I liked this story because it talks about the effect of the transition from oral culture to written culture on memory and cultural shift. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that Chang illustrates this is by having the second sort of strand of this braided story, which features an unnamed journalist as the narrator, who is talking about this futuristic technology, which is, you know, the story is set some unknown number of years in the future, when everyone has started using Remem, which are these sort of optical cameras sort of you're carrying around this iris cam, which is just giving you access to video footage of a whole bunch of things that have happened in your life, all of these moments that would have gone undocumented, mm -hmm. like the moment when Lauren and I decided to start a podcast. Yeah, we could go back and get the definitive version, <laughs> which, you know, for us would be an amusing resolution. But our unnamed protagonist goes back to look at all the arguments he had with his teenage daughter, which like Oof. is never going to end well. <laughs> <laughs> and so it causes the unnamed narrator of that story to reassess his relationship with his daughter and the accuracy or the emotional truth of these memories that he's been feeling in one particular way and how it feels to go back and look at them from the perspective of this disinterested camera, which was also present at the scene. And we are so familiar with writing as a technology and as a memory tool. It was kind of nice to be put in the position of being slightly bamboozled by this future technology and how that would once again make us reassess our relationship with, as the title of the story says, the truth of fact and the truth of feeling. We'll link to the short story because it's available online. I definitely endorse reading it. But what did you think about it when you read it? I assume that the story of Jijingi is it, – it seems to be drawing on the kind of thing that we see happen when – Western cultures brought literacy in with them because there's all these dynamics around the written record changing the oral tradition where different tribes would talk about how they were related to each other. And then they were like, no, because you've written it down here and the written version is the definitive version. So we're not going to honor like the current status of knowledge about which groups your group is aligned with. I assumed like the specifics of that were fiction, but it seems to really capture the vibe of that. Well, interestingly, so this specific case is a real case that happened. And of course, the, huh. you know, specific names of the people involved and what they were thinking, I think, are indeed fictionalized. But the Tiv people of Nigeria had a set of genealogies that were being used in settling court disputes, and they were recorded by the British and in the colonial context, and then they diverged in the oral tradition from the written thing. And then the later oral people were saying, no, like, you guys have written down the wrong thing. Like, we have what's true here. Because that's what's true at this point in time for, like, we're friends with this community over here right now and not this other village. So we're going to update the story to reflect the current state of things. Right. And there isn't perceived to be a rupture in that the way writing can create a rupture between your sort of perceived self yeah. versus the the version of yourself that you've projected into the past. So what I was told was that Chang had read an academic manuscript about the effects of orality and literacy on cultures and on humans by an academic named Walter J. Ong, and sort of been inspired to take a few sentences from that and expand that into a whole short story that elaborates on the emotional truths addressed in that relatively dry academic fashion. It's very satisfying because I was like, this feels like a, a story, but it did feel grounded in an understanding of how literacy can change social dynamics. Yeah. So 
I was inspired to read the academic book as well by this, but the short story conveys these truths in a more vivid storytelling way, which sort of gets to the whole storytelling themes that come up from making things memorable by telling them as stories. And I appreciate you sent me the short story and not the 200-page academic manuscript. (laughs) I read the 200-page academic manuscript, and I think it's very interesting. We'll return to more things from the Ong book so that not everybody has to read it. (laughs) But one of the things that reading this Ong book about orality and literacy made me reflect on was what he calls residual orality, Mm -hmm. like little pockets of our lives and our experiences that may still be in an oral culture, even when we're living predominantly written cultures, which, you know, you and I are both predominantly in a written culture. And one example of this coming up in my life was I'm just sort of young enough to remember when social media changed the way that gossip worked Hmm. to be more written from being more oral. Ah, yes. So I remember in a sort of pre-Facebook era of gossip, where let's say there was a party and I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. If some sort of big drama happened at the party, you know, I can't believe so-and-so said this to so-and-so, there was a big fight or something. And I wanted to try to reconstruct what happened. I had to go talk to a bunch of people. And I remember doing this, talk to a bunch of people, get their sort of stories, um, which would all be a little bit different from each other and kind of decide what I believed from that based on my knowledge of these people and their personalities and what they were likely to tell as a story. Yeah. And I remember being a really weird experience when Facebook started and people would be posting things that were sort of in view of just their friends. And you could see similar types of dramas playing out. You know, I can't believe what this person said to this person. But you could actually read the whole thing and you could be present for the whole thing. And you could have that sort of factive truth of sort of witnessing the whole thing, even though if you weren't there at the time, because in a few hours later, it would still be there. And the pulling out your phone to tell someone some gossip that's happened because you want to hold up the Instagram photo or you want to show them the, you know, Facebook thread where all the drama went down. Right. Like screen cap culture of, I can't believe this person said this thing. I'm going to take a screen cap and just show it to you rather than I'm going to report the story of what happened from my perspective has made gossip more of a written culture than an oral culture where we have less acceptance for the fact that things may change a bit in the retelling, or you may retell the version as you experienced it from your own perspective and sort of massage it to be more of a story with emotional beats at particular places. Hmm. Now you pull out a screen cap or you pull out the actual version, let me just read you what this person sent me. And gossip has gotten more written in the last like 20 years, which you can phrase that as a loss. And it's also harder for people to deny, obviously, jerkish behavior. Mm -hmm. So there are pluses to it, but it is something that's changed. Another area that I think of as residual oral culture is when it comes to fairy tales. And as a kid, it took me a long time. And I think a lot of people struggle with this tension where the animated film version of a fairy tale is different to the picture book that you have, which is different to a different picture book that someone else might have or the version that your grandmother told you not from a book, just the version that she had. And this is how fairy tales traditionally go. And this idea that there's like a written canonical version kind of came about when the Grimm brothers decided to record fairy tales that they had encountered as part of their general documenting of German language and German history. I love that the Grimm brothers are known most broadly for their fairy tale writing down. In linguistics, they're known for doing all of this amazing historical research on the sounds of German and proto-German. And so fairy tales are like their secondary (laughs) claim to fame for linguists. Um. But giving the sort of claim to fame of the people who did the documentation when what they were actually doing was documenting a thing that was in the collective memory of a group of people – is a theme Mm -hmm. that keeps coming back when it comes to oral culture. And again, like I am grateful to the Grimm brothers for writing all of these stories down because otherwise I probably wouldn't know them, um, as with many of the documenters. But on the other hand, they sort of end up getting credit or claiming credit for all of these people whose names we don't know who iterated on various versions of these fairy tales 
because they were part of a collective oral tradition. But also writing something down doesn't mean that it will stay a part of the transmission tradition. You know, the Grimm brothers over multiple volumes and multiple reversions of it ended up with around 200 fairy tales. I don't know 200 fairy tales. You mean you don't know the three snake leaves? I know Cinderella. <laughs> Are you looking forward to the animated remake of The Mouse, the Bird, and the Sausage? I know the princess and the pea. <laughs> <laughs> So some grim fairy tales have stood the test of time and others have not remained in transmission for different groups of people. You might be uh, from a different part of the world where you still know uh, the magic table, the gold donkey and the club in the sack. But uh, that's not one that I've kept in my family repository of stories. But writing lets things remain in an archive for someone to rediscover rather than the sort of cultural pruning of the oral tradition where the bits that gets remembered are the bits that get continually repeated. And there's a lot of oral culture that we only have thanks to the written form. Homer and the Homeric epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey only exist because someone at some point wrote down a version of those stories. Well, and somebody who, who may or may not have been a guy named Homer – but I have a statue of the bust of Homer. Like, he was a person. <laughs> I mean, there certainly was some person and some people somewhere. But Homer is, in many ways, a sort of cultural folkloric figure himself. Mm -hmm. So by tradition, these poems are attributed to Homer. But they may not have even been written by the same dude. They certainly seem to have some temporal distinctions between the Iliad and the Odyssey. And they were definitely part of the ancient Greek oral tradition because they have a lot of structural features that are characteristic of the oral tradition, the sort of episodic structure, the formulaic things like, you know, wily Odysseus and owl-eyed Athena and the various epithets that get attached to the characters who are these clear archetypes. And Homer himself, like, we don't really know. This idea that he was like this blind guy is because one of the bards in one of the Homeric poems is blind. And people have said, well, maybe this is a self-insert because he himself was blind. We don't know. Amazing. The paintings and the busts and so on of Homer are all produced like several hundred years later. And they're sort of like fanfic adaptations of him. <laughs> I actually feel more impressed when I discovered that Homer wasn't a single person. And in fact, this whole debate about the status of him is known as the Homeric question. But I feel more impressed knowing that there wasn't just one person who told these stories, but there were and still are people across this region who would remember thousands and thousands of lines of oral stories and be able to perform them, not word for word every time, but they would hit the same beats, they would be transmitting the same stories, they would all put their own spin on it, and that this continued on for centuries and millennia. And somehow I find that more powerful than the idea that there was this one dude in particular who was really good at this. Yeah, it wasn't the sort of lone genius. It was a culture that supported bardic storytelling. And it wasn't necessarily a culture that just, you know, disappeared with ancient Greece. In fact, even well into the 20th century, if you went to the region in Europe around there, there would be people in, you know, mountain villages who still sang epic songs of incredible length. And Milman Parry was an American classicist who decided to see if there were any um, modern homers, as it was kind of put. And he recorded one song that was performed over five days and ended up being like 13,000 lines. Wow. Which is just an amazing skill to have and one that as a literate person, I just don't, like I've not grown up to be trained to have the kind of memory to perform that kind of feat. That's really neat. And I think a thing that interests me about the question of the Homeric recordings and Mill and Perry's recordings is that the Homeric Greeks, who are whoever Homer was, or all the Homers were, <laughs> were using this new technology to them of writing to record these oral poems that were very important to them culturally. Then you have Milman Perry using also the latest and greatest recording technology, which was what, like wax cylinders? Oh my gosh, I think it was these like 
aluminium discs that they had to swap out every five minutes or something. <laughs> I can't even imagine the amount of equipment that they had to move around to make this happen. And yet it's still such a feat to record like a five-day poem. Mm-hmm. There's also a big recording feat that happened in the 1960s to record the window epic from the Nyanga people in the Congo. Oh, cool. And the, the poet there, who was Kandi Roreke, was asked to narrate all of the stories of Mwindo, who's the sort of hero of these folk stories, and said, you know, never had anybody performed all of the episodes in sequence. Mm. But he narrated as a result of the negotiations between the researchers who, who wanted to, to do this, all of the Mwindo stories, sometimes in prose, sometimes in verse, over 12 days. Oh my gosh. And there were three scribes, two Nyanga scribes and one Belgian scribe, who were writing down his words at the same time, because it's obviously sort of faster than a person can write. And this is not like writing a novel or a poem. It's much more of a performance. And after the end of those 12 days, he was exhausted, obviously. I'm not surprised. <laughs> yeah. But it's already framed in terms of like the, the demands of writing, which says, okay, we're going to try to do this in a big, tight sequence and have this sort of efficient thing. Oral poems are created to be told to people for maybe, you know, an hour or two in the evenings. And then the next day you tell another story for an hour or two. And together they form an episodic mythology of here are all the stories of the gods, or here are all the stories of the heroes, or here are all the stories of these archetypal legendary figures, you know, the the princesses and the dragons and these types of things. And as a member of the Nyanga community, you hear all the Mwindo stories across your lifetime. The idea that you would sit down and tell them in some kind of sequence is not the normal way these are performed. Right, exactly. So there, there's a story about Mwindo, who's the hero, the omnicompetent hero. His epithet is little one just born he walked. So he, he walked as soon as he was born. And there are stories about how he climbed from the womb, and in one case emerged from his mother's belly button. This is the version from the recording with Rureke that I was able to find. But I also saw in a different encyclopedia that Mwindo emerged from his mother's middle finger. So... They're both clearly doing a sort of similar, like, preternatural birth style story and emerging from your belly button or from your middle finger, but the sort of details can vary. But in both cases, the important stuff is still there, where he's like helping his mother with chores even while he's still in the womb. And he's walking and talking from the moment he's born, and his father is trying to only have daughters because there's a prophecy that his son will be his downfall. So he tries to kill Mwindo even as a baby, and of course he doesn't succeed because this is a hero. What a precocious child. Exactly. But the birth story is sort of one of the many stories that gets told and isn't necessarily told in sequence where it's like, well, first he was born and then this thing happened and then this thing happened. You could pick any one of them to tell on a given night. It's interesting how we see stuff vary in oral narratives, but there's also something really compelling about what is emerging as the same across different stories and often across large areas. I mentioned briefly that the Grimm brothers kicked off this whole recording of folk stories and fairy stories across Europe and beyond, and people have looked at the similarities there. But there's this even bigger story that I find really compelling, which is the story of the Seven Sisters, which I know from Indigenous Australian narrative tradition. I've heard of the Seven Sisters as referring to a Greek story about the constellation that I also know as the Pleiades. So it's sort of got this very closely clustered set of stars in the night sky that it's sort of like it's shaped like a teeny tiny big dipper, <laughs> I think of it. But in my recollection, when I've looked at the Pleiades myself, I've seen six stars. And yet the Greek stories about the seven sisters, the indigenous Australian stories about the seven sisters. Yeah, the story in Australia is about the same set of Pleiades of which there are six if you look in the sky now, but some astronomers did some research that looked at how one of those stars is actually two stars, one in front of the other. And if you rewound the sky 10,000 years, they would be two different stars. Whoa. And the story of the seven sisters is that one of them is shy and you don't see her and she hides herself. And it seems like this story that gets told across cultures is to account for what has been a changing of the sky across millennia. 
That's fascinating. So this lost seventh star or seventh person represented by the star has been found in European, African, Asian, Indonesian, Native American, Indigenous Australian cultures that have, I mean, they're a very clustery cluster. I have to mm-hmm. say, if you're looking at the night sky and looking for like, I think these ones all go together, they're very close according to our visual perception on Earth. I can see why you'd come up with a story about them. And being in the night sky is a really good hook for remembering this story and continuing to pass it on as you all look up into the sky. Yeah. But the fact that this seventh star has been transmitted for maybe 10,000 years is, is phenomenal. Yeah. And a really great example of how oral culture can be a really great way of preserving knowledge or recording history, not in the way that we think about it with writing and not to say that that's the only value that it has because it absolutely doesn't. But it is one really interesting thing about the way we preserve and transmit these stories. And we don't have written records that are 10,000 years old. Writing is not Mm -hmm. that old. And so when scientists have sometimes wondered, how could we try to transmit a message to people 10,000 years in the future? If we look towards the past of what kinds of things did get transmitted, maybe we need to take inspiration from oral cultures. And one group of scientists and folklorists who've been trying to figure out the way to transmit messages for a long period of time are people who are trying to come up with long-term nuclear waste warning messages. Mm, Because uh, that nuclear waste is still going to be nasty well beyond any period we know we have successfully transmitted messages in human history to date. Right. So there's this fascinatingly named field of research called nuclear semiotics. Oh, Oh, that that sounds amazing. What is that? Uh, which is the study of, you know, how to create nuclear warning messages that will still be intelligible 10,000 years in the future. Oh, because we have that like yellow triangle with the black spiky symbol. But I've absolutely heard of people who are like, my five-year-old looked at that symbol and thought it was a flower. Right. Or if you use like a skull, well, sometimes skulls are, you know, maybe it's pirates. <laughs> Yellow might be meaning that it's something really cool in here rather than like a bit of a warning. Right. And, you know, there's a lot of proposals and some of them are more practical and some of them are a little bit more wacky. You know, certainly writing it out in a whole bunch of different languages so that even if some of them aren't in common use in, you know, thousands of years, maybe at least some of them will still be sort of around. Or maybe we'll reverted entirely to being oral cultures again. (laughs) Literacy has arrived. It may not stay. But if literacy doesn't stick around, Mm -hmm. then one of my favorite proposals is the breeding of so-called radiation cats or ray cats. Mm -hmm. Because we have had cats for more than 10,000 years. We know that. That is true. And so if you bred a special type of cats where they would change color when they came near radioactive emissions. Right. And then you'd have to transmit the message that if the cat changes color, it's bad. Oh, you make a folk story out of color-changing kitties, which will be out there in the world. And right. hopefully that story gets passed on along with the other folk tales. So you have to make a like a fairy tale and myths and poetry and music and painting about the dangers of color-changing cats. And you have to get all of the cats or many of the cats to be color-changing. But like people like cats. And there was a, an episode of the podcast 99% Invisible where they commissioned a musician to write a song about Ray Katz for a 2014 episode about this, which was called 10,000 Year Earworm to Discourage Settlement Near Nuclear Waste Repositories, Don't Change Color Kitty, which is supposed to be so catchy and annoying that it might, might actually get handed down and stay working. But I have to say, I have never heard people sing this song in a cultural folkloric sense, so I don't know if they succeeded in having it be transmitted even 10 years. But, you know, I listened to that episode many years ago, and as soon as you said color-changing kitties, I knew exactly what was happening, even though I did not know nuclear semiotics. So there you go. There might be hope. So maybe if it's a wacky enough idea, people will keep talking about it because it sounds so cool. It's really good applied folklore studies there. You know, in addition to transmitting information about like how many stars are in this particular constellation, this speaks to the role of folklore and oral cultures in shaping behavior. Mm -hmm. 
And maybe that's, you know, telling people to not go near the color changing cats. But also there's a whole bunch of, you know, like Aesop's fables around things like jealousy or things like, you know, ingenuity, various sort of clever things that foxes do or things like that. Those are ways of telling people about appropriate or inappropriate behavior. I bet you're going to tell me Aesop isn't real either. Um, well, look, it seems like the fables originally were part of oral tradition and were written down about three centuries after Aesop's death. Okay, so like, (laughs) the fact of feeling rather than the fact of truth. I get it. I think at that point, there were various things that once you have Aesop's fables as a template for a certain type of morality story, Mm -hmm. you can ascribe various other kinds of stories and jokes and proverbs to him, even though some of that is from earlier than his period or is not just strictly from the Greek cultural area. And Aesop's fables where, you know, usually animals perform different actions and they have moral consequences, it's it's actually a really good teaching tool, like teaching children about cultural expectations around behavior and what counts as good behavior and what counts as rude behavior. That's really hard. And having stories to do that with rather than waiting for them to make every possible social mistake is a really great cultural tool. And like a lot of kids these days will buy their kid a you know, picture book about like, here's the potty and why you might want to use it. (laughs) Or saying thank you, it's important. (laughs) Here's all the ways we can say thank you to also try to mold their kids behavior into Mm -hmm. some of the things that are culturally important to us. Yeah, it's why it's really fun to see different morality stories across different cultures as really interesting ways to see what a particular culture values. There's an interesting story about Inuit storytelling as used to discipline or to train children into things that are important. Uh, Mm -hmm. So obviously, it's important for kids to, you know, stay away and be careful around the ocean where they could easily drown. Um, And instead of sort of yelling at them, you know, don't go near the water, you can tell them a story about like a sea monster who is in the water who could eat little children, which is a little bit more vivid in terms of the potential. It certainly gets the point across. (laughs) Yeah, it's a, it's a bit more vivid than just saying, don't go near the water, it's not safe, to tell you, here's this sort of fanciful story that the kid, you know, may or may not completely believe in a literal sense, but conveys this message of, you know, this is dangerous and don't do that. And, you know, we don't just have to tell children stories to teach them lessons. Society has a long tradition of telling children stories at bedtime. There's a really fun version of this. So another epic poem that was sort of written down so early that we don't know the original poet's name, Mm -hmm. is Beowulf in the Old English tradition. Yep. In this case, we don't even have sort of a a Homer name, even though we don't know anything about Homer. Homer's name is ascribed to this poem by tradition. In the case of Beowulf, we just call this person the Beowulf poet because we don't even know who wrote it down or which exact people it passed through. But it has many of these similar characteristics in terms of having these formulaic elements and these rhythmic elements that make it easy to remember as a poem and eventually get written down. And it was written so early in the history of English that we've even talked in a previous episode about how there is a modern translation of it into an English that is more accessible to us today. Yeah, there are many translations of it into various different kinds and registers of modern English. And at the time, I was very excited about the Maria Davin Headley translation, which begins with bro, <laughs> to translate the the what word at the beginning, which gets your attention. Um, other people have also translated this word with things like so and look or listen. There's another new translation of this poem, mm-hmm. which reimagines it as a children's story, where all the characters are children and the monster that comes and eats the warriors and drags them back to his lair and so on is instead a sort of grumpy old neighbor who goes into the children's treehouse and makes them grow up, you know, instantly into boring adults. Oh, how terrifying. (laughs) And the connection here is that this adaptation was written by Zach Wienersmith, who's a webcomics guy, mostly, who started telling it as a story to his kids as a bedtime story. Aww. And found that oral culture stories, even though we think of them as sort of high culture and complicated and things, actually tell really well to children because children are still operating under an oral culture in many cases because they haven't learned how to read yet. Oh my gosh, you're so right. I feel like my early primary schooling days were such a rich 
world of like all those rhymes and stories and games that you learn as a little kid. Oh, so good. Right, like the skipping games and the clapping games, yeah. which get transmitted by other children. And sometimes you meet someone from somewhere else and they've got like a slightly different version of Ring Around the Rosie. Yeah, mine was Ring Around the Rosie, a pocket full of posy, a tissue, a tissue, we all fall down. Mine was Ashes, Ashes, we all fall down. Oh, there you go. I mean, yours is obviously incorrect, but like, good for you. <laughs> we were transmitted different versions of those rhymes, but they have this, you know, characteristic game of, you know, holding hands and, and running around in a circle and falling down that they go with. Yeah. Even if parts of it, especially the little bit more nonsensical parts, got transmitted into something else that felt a bit more sensical. So how does the Beowulf retelling read? It must be fun to read out loud. It's really fun to read out loud. Here's the first couple lines, which go, Hey, wait, listen to the lives of the long ago kids, the world fighters, the parent unminding kids, the improper, the politeness proof, the unbowed bully crushers, the bedtime breakers, the raspberry blowers, fighters of fun killers, fearing nothing, fated for fame. Oh, so good. And I love that it's it's doing the alliterative Anglo-Saxon meter and it's doing all these very old English compounds of, mm -hmm. you know, world fighters and bedtime breakers and fun killers. Um, that's still accessible. That's still accessible and, you know, playing with the language, but in a way that's still available to kids. Um, I recommended it to some of my friend's kids and they said their five-year-old loved it. So Perfect. A lot of highly literate people are untrained in oral storytelling that, you know, personally, having something I can read to replicate that experience uh, is really reassuring for me as a limited capacity literate person here. <laughs> I also think it's neat because, like, children's stories are trying to do sort of two different things. Mm -hmm. And one of those is create pre-literate and early literate and proto-literate children by giving them these books with relatively simple language and words that are relatively phonetically spelled, especially for English, which is not very phonetically spelled all the time, and trying to give them something that they might be able to read by themselves relatively early on. And then simultaneously, these kids are quite sophisticated language users in the oral domain. And so giving them texts that are very dense and rich and have a lot going on and aren't simple texts that they could read by themselves, but let them engage with that level of oral language that they already have is this sort of other thing that children's storytelling can also do. And a lot of these stories were either told, you know, fairy tales are traditionally told to children, but also are traditionally told to mixed audiences, including both adults and children. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting to see that more explicitly brought back. It's interesting when you look across things like Beowulf and the stories of Mwendo and the stories that we have from the Homeric epics, you see, as there is in this Ong book, all of these features of particularly oral storytelling, that it doesn't have to be beginning to end, it doesn't have to always be exactly the same every time. And it's these features that make you realise what a weird genre the idea of like narrative fiction in book form is, and again, how literacy has created this weird layer over the top of human storytelling. And it took hundreds of years of literacy for someone to invent the novel, mm -hmm. right? Like poetry is much older than the novel and sort of diary or memoir or here's my life story is much older than the novel. But the idea that an author can sort of see into characters' brains and tell you what they're thinking <laughs> and tell you what a bunch of people are thinking, but in this very sort of psychoanalytic way and in a way that is sort of linked together. And one of the points that I thought was interesting that Ong makes in the book is that many of the early novelists were women, perhaps even because they were educated enough to be literate, but not educated in the what he calls residually oral classical tradition that the men were being educated in at the time. So they were more willing to look at writing as its own medium and to see what writing could be capable of that wasn't trying to like learn Latin and study Greek rhetoric, or in the case of Murasaki writing the first novel in Japanese, learning as much of the classical tradition that was still bound up in this rhetorical history of trying to learn these very formal and stylized and performative types of stories. Yeah, we talked about Murasaki's Tale of Genji in our translation episode as well. And that 
was kind of written and then no one paid attention to it for literally hundreds of years. It's like a millennium old. And it was then, very popular at the time. <laughs> yeah, just like kind of written for her friends, we think. It's all very opaque what the kind of context of that being created was. And fiction for a long time was not taken seriously as a written art form. It was all about the oral storytelling in cultures that are now very book story focused. Right. And you have Jane Austen sort of inventing the what we can think of as the modern novel, at least in English speaking cultures. And yeah, some of these early novel writers not being educated as much in this classical rhetorical tradition. Fascinating. I've never really thought about it before, but it's an interesting observation. One thing that I will say that I disagree with. So Olga's writing this book, which is very interesting, in 1982, and our thoughts on some things have changed since 1982. Right, okay. And one of the points that oral culture people who are sort of newly encountering writing make, and Mm -hmm. like Plato has Socrates make this point when he's writing down Socrates' speeches, because this was also a sort of early transition from oral to written culture – is that when you have a person telling you something, that person can be asked questions and can be interrogated, can answer and be held to account for the story that they're telling you. You can ask them how they know things. When you have a written book, you are just forced to take the writer's thoughts and opinions on their say-so at this one snapshot of the time that they've written them down. And you don't have the living person there to ask questions of. And so we sort of think as very literate culture people that the book is like the better version, (laughs) but not actually having access to the person is both a plus because it can live on beyond them and also a downside because their thoughts might have changed and you don't have a way of knowing that when all you have is a record from one period of time. Which is to say that the Ong book is not great about sign languages, by which I mean it just really doesn't include or look at them. I do. <laughs> yeah. And charitably, I'm going to say that the research has come a long way since 1982 when it was published. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Ong's dead now, so we don't know what he thought in more recent times. But what the sign language research does show is that even though orality and oral cultures is this term that's based on, you know, the mouth and the voice, the cultural phenomena that we now attach to that word are very much features of signed language cultures and deaf cultures as well. We have that great interview with Gab Hodge, where she told us all about the amazing resources that deaf people have for storytelling in signed languages, particularly Auslan and BSL that she works in. And I also came across a very interesting discussion from a listserv from 1993. Oh my gosh. How did you manage that? We couldn't even go back to DMs from five years ago. (laughs) This got archived as a PDF from the ORTRAD listserv, the Center for Studies on Oral Tradition. Amazing. And there's an electronic conversation on deafness and orality that got preserved in this very, very written culture way because I was able to go back and read what people were writing in 1993. And it's slightly edited to add little footnotes about like, this is an emoticon. Here's what an emoticon is, because maybe in 1993, you don't know that. (laughs) So cool. Okay, what is in this Lissa conversation? There is a lot of really good commentary from Lois Bragg, who was a deaf Mm -hmm. professor at Gallaudet University, who was talking about the deaf community doing oral culture. And she was very clear that this is something that she thinks applies to the deaf community. And that there is a lot of narrative that is epic and legendary and sort of somewhat historical or autobiographical, and it tends to be quite stylized. Mm -hmm. And this is what she thought of as characteristic of deaf culture. There's a lot of storytelling and plays and poems and and wordplay and things like that. And there was some discussion with both Lois Bragg and Stephanie Hall, and this is in 1993, that deafness is in this unique situation regarding literacy, because there isn't the one widely used way of writing sign language that lots of deaf people Mm. use, although there's a variety of systems that researchers and various people use experimentally. So this is still an oral culture that has maybe sort of a relationship to English as a literate culture that's kind of like the Anglo-Saxons who were going home and speaking Old English to each other and learning to read and write in Latin, which is a completely different language just to access the technology of writing. Hmm. So even though deaf people can learn to read in English or another oral language that has a written tradition, there isn't a sort of 
endogenous way of writing signed languages that's widely accepted. One bit of oral tradition that I love that's kind of at the opposite end of the scale from remembering a full epic, maybe this is just because of my terrible literate person memory, but I love the oral tradition of memorable units, Mm. of like small sayings that everyone remembers and get embedded into your like reflexive response to things. So things like a stitch in time saves nine, and you have to learn what that means But you get told it a whole bunch and then you learn what it means and then you say it to people when they want to put off doing something that needs doing. (laughs) Or something like Red Sky at Night, Sailor's Delight, and how you can learn, oh, okay, so if the sunset is really red, the weather is more likely to be nice the next day. Ah, I have it as Red Sky at Night, Shepherd's Delight. (laughs) Well, you see, I grew up on the coast. (laughs) That's your maritime culture coming through, my pastoralist culture coming through there. (laughs) Or measure twice, cut once, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Mm. I was about to say they rhyme often or are alliterative, and that one doesn't, but still sticks in my mind. (laughs) Yeah, they've got a certain sort of metrical quality to them, like the longer poems, and we've retained the sort of shorter proverby bits of memorable units. I was thinking about when I was reading the Ong book, and he talks a lot about residual orality, even in cultures that are primarily literate. Hmm. And I have an example in my own life about a thing that I did that was part of oral culture. I worked as a tour guide as a summer job. Uh-huh. And we had a half hour guided tour of the museum that, you know, the various tour guides would give the sort of the same way. And, you know, once I had been been working there for a few months, I had certain jokes and anecdotes and beats that I knew, things that would work as laugh lines and things that were sort of more serious and sort of ways to get from the serious bits to the funnier bits and not just sort of have sudden transitions there. Yeah. And I had the memory of which bits that I said at which parts of the tour keyed to different locations along the route within the museum, which is a very longstanding memory technique. For sure. And I learned to do that tour in an oral culture way by watching some other people's guided tours. And then they said, okay, you can probably do one now. (laughs) Um, Amazing. And one time I saw a script of the guided tour written out and it just felt weird. Like it felt flat and it didn't have the jokes in it the same way. It didn't have the delivery. And some of our tour guides would try to learn it from the written script and it just didn't feel like it was the tour, the way it existed in this more fully featured and three-dimensional and located in time and space version as it was in my mind. And you might not always give the tour exactly the same way twice, but you were probably paying attention to like, oh, this is a an audience that really likes the emotional bits. I'm going to maybe tone down the jokes or I'm going to move through this bit quickly. You can really react to the moment. Right. Or these people are, you know, giving me lots of laughs, so I'm going to be even jokier. And I would have, you know, versions that I would do with seniors or with kids that would be a little bit different. But yeah, it felt like it was this very oral object that I hadn't realized that I had that part of oral culture in my memory. And the other thing that I thought about when I was reading this Walter J. Ong book, and which made me wish that I had read it before I wrote Because Internet, but, you know, a book is a snapshot of a moment in time. Oh, it's not an oral saga that you can update depending on the season. I can't just update it. So I'm doing the updating in our oral saga of the podcast, (laughs) which is thinking about the relationship of internet memes to oral culture. Because in oral culture, the only things that get transmitted are things that have been put into a form that is memorable. Yeah. So proverbs like red sky at night, sailor's delight, you can substitute sailor for shepherd because they have the same number of syllables and it still works. But if you try to say uh, red sky at night, sailor's enjoyment, (laughs) (laughs) that one doesn't get remembered the same way. And at some point, someone sat down and explained to me, you know, the reason we say this is because where the sun is reflecting off the sky at the sunset or the sunrise reflects what's happening with the clouds. And that gives you some indication of what might happen with precipitation later on that day. Like, sure, that's an explanation, but it's not as catchy. Yeah. And and weather tends to move from west to east because of the rotation of the earth and and all various things like that. Yeah. But it's the mnemonic red sky at night, sailor's light that sticks with you in your brain. And you have to 
preserve that mnemonic in a form that is memorable and that is pass aroundable. And if you say something like red sky at night saves nine, <laughs> you can lead a horse to water, but it's worth two in the bush. Hmm. <laughs> These are sort of silly, playful things that we can do because we have that memory of them. But memes are not oral culture in that sticky mnemonic way. Yeah. The thing that enables memes is being able to Google them. And the thing that enables the tremendous proliferation of memes, and there are so many of them, like the early stages of memes were more oral, like I can has cheeseburger was just the same image that kept getting repeated in a whole bunch of contexts. Yeah. Whereas now you have a template of a meme that's like the distracted boyfriend meme where you have like the guy and he's looking at the one girl and the other girl's looking at him. And you can put a whole bunch of different labels on that. And because you can search for the template and you can search for the name and you can see a whole bunch of people making their riffs and then you make your own riff and it sort of prizes originality and riffing off of it. Like when I see a new meme that's been going around, sometimes I, I look it up or I read like the meme explainer of like, here's what it is from like Vox or somebody. You have to work backwards, and that's been five minutes, not 500 years. <laughs> right. And the fact that there are all these sort of templates and variants that we make of the memes rather than sort of repeating the same really sticky one, that's actually a very written culture phenomenon that there's lots of different versions and edits and meta commentaries. Whereas having something that's more sticky that just gets repeated is a more oral culture thing. So sometimes people try to say that memes are oral culture because they're pointing at something. But what they're actually pointing at is that memes are like an extreme of written culture rather than an extreme of oral culture, which is like they are a cultural shift, but they're a cultural shift in the opposite direction that people typically say. Which I just, I wish I'd been able to put that in because internet, but here's the updated version. <laughs> This episode has really once again hammered home how unusual in the course of human history written literacy is and how amazing and creative and powerful and how much of a skill oral literacy is. And it's hard for us to even talk about oral literacy or oral literature without using metaphors brought in from literate culture. Yeah. And even when we try to project our memory of what it could have been like to not be literate, we end up bringing in a bunch of our literate assumptions and people doing the sort of detailed ethnography and record keeping of oral cultures help us disturb some of those and understand more deeply a very old and also still present way to be human. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on all of the podcast platforms or lingthusiasm.com, and you can get transcripts of every episode on lingthusiasm.com slash transcripts. You can follow at Lingthusiasm on social media sites. You can get scarves with lots of linguistics patterns on them, including IPA, branching tree diagrams, Boober and Kiki, and our favourite esoteric Unicode symbols, plus other Lingthusiasm merch like our new Etymology Isn't Destiny t-shirts, and aesthetic IPA posters at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. My social media and blog is Superlinguo. Links to my social media can be found at GretchenMcCulloch.com, my blog is AllThingsLinguistic.com, and my book about internet language is called Because Internet. Lingthusiasm is able to keep existing thanks to the support of our patrons. If you want to get an extra Lingthusiasm episode to listen to every month, our entire archive of bonus episodes to listen to right now, or if you just want to help keep the show running ad-free, go to patreon.com slash Lingthusiasm, or follow the links from our website. Patrons can also get access to our Discord chat room to talk with other linguistics fans, and be the first to find out about new merch and other announcements. Recent bonus topics include an episode about swearing in fiction, some of our favorite deleted scenes from interviews that we've done over the past year or two, and the hosts of Lingthusiasm do the super scientific Which Lingthusiasm Episode Are You quiz, as well as reporting on the results of the Lingthusiasm survey and talking about what's coming up for the next year. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay too. We also really appreciate it if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone in your life who's curious about language. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our senior producer is Claire Gorn. Our editorial producer is Sarah Doppiarella. Our production assistant is Martha Tsutsui Billens. And our editorial assistant is John Crook. Our music is Ancient City by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!